Thanks, Joe. Good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, an evaluation we did a couple of years ago, uh, reviewing reports by EPA on nitrate and water wells over in the Yakima Basin east of here. Um, it was three specific reports that were prepared by Region 10. Uh, the evaluation was funded by the Washington State Dairy Federation. I don't know if Jake Gordon's here in the room, but also by dairy producers in New Mexico. Beverly Itzinga and Kate Whitefoot is here. So they're the two entities that asked us to do this technical review. And uh, these are the three specific reports that we reviewed. I don't need to read them all. They're all on EPA's website. So we're going to look at specifically the hydrogeology, some limited geochemistry and isotope geochemistry, and how to proactively manage nutrients. There's a lot of other uh, issues that we had with EPA's report, but for the purpose of this presentation and try and keep the time down, we're just going to address these specific issues. Uh, this is a map from the Department of Ecology here showing the nitrate vulnerability of wells 145 feet deep or shallower, and you can see on the eastern side of the state, it's a probability that nitrate concentration will exceed 2 milligrams per liter uh, for the Folks here that aren't real water quality people, the nitrate standard in groundwater is 10 milligrams per liter. So in conducting an investigation like this, especially on a regional scale, we've got a lot of challenges. We have a very complex setting here because we have multiple sources of nitrate. We have dairies. We have farm fields with chemical or organic fertilizer. We have orchards with chemical or organic fertilizers. And we also have homes with septic systems. So you, as you can see, you know, at least just to try and simplify it, we have four different potential sources of nitrate in the area that we can identify readily. Can you guys see? Okay. So once again, in this complex setting, you know, hypothet this hypothetical example, we're not looking to track from individual berries right now. We're talking about how you would really conduct this study in a way that makes scientific sense. So you know, what is the source of or the pathway for nitrate in the monitoring locations? You know, here's a monitoring location over here. So what are the sources? Is it an improperly installed or maintained septic system? You know, EPA had no records on whether or not when these septic systems were installed, whether or not they were installed with an inspector there, whether or not there are cesspools, whether or not there's leach fields. And if you look down here, these little purple rectangles, you can see numerous uh, of these rectangles here, are all individual homes with individual septic tanks, and then by inference, individual domestic wells. So we really don't know if these wells were completed properly, if they've got cement seals at the surface, if they've got cement seals below grade, the top 20 or 40 feet, to prevent any, prevent any surface uh, migration into these wells. We don't know if the sources are farmland upgrading from the dairy. We don't know whether the sources are farmlands where a uh, farmer has overapplied commercial fertilizer, which isn't regulated like our manures are regulated. We don't know whether the farm, farmer's using manure from dairies. And we don't know whether it's coming from orchards. So in this, like the challenge here is to really break out this complex setting and to try and simplify it. So really, how would you determine this? You know, in the Yakima Valley, here's Granger, here's Sunnyside. Yakima's up over here. Richland, Pasco's down here. There really, there really are no monitoring wells present looking at specific sources. Existing wells are completed at a range of different depths, depending on what the driller did, depending on how much money the person had to pay the driller to complete the well. And the completion information, their depth, the depths of the screens for many of the existing wells is just flat out unavailable. And this is not uncommon throughout the United States, where even though you've got requirements at the state level for drillers to submit logs, do specific completions uh, for contamination, uh, inhibiting contamination coming in from the surface, a lot of them just don't do it. And that really falls on the state regulatory agencies more than anybody else. And so 
in the sort, EPA was trying to look at source tracking. So they focused on groundwater chemistry, assuming incorrectly that indicators such as pesticides or other trace organics would tie the groundwater nitrate to specific source. But the organics behave very differently than much more highly soluble or mobile nitrate. Plus, aquifer characteristics and sampling well completion were not fully assessed, but they directly affect the movement of nitrate in groundwater. Therefore, one of our conclusions is that the choice of the study design really prevented conclusive results, despite all the effort and money EPA put into this. You really want to start out with your regional hydrogeology, because none of these potential sources are isolated. Source tracking requires an in-depth knowledge of the aquifer properties such as groundwater flow direction, the thickness of the aquifer, <coughs> hydraulic conductivity of the aquifer, vertical leakage between layers. And in addition, we need to understand the localized effects of ditches and drains and production wells on groundwater flow that can affect the gradient or change the gradient as we see in a lot of places. So bringing it down to a scale at the valley level here, in the Yakima Valley we've got three aquifers and they're interconnected. The, we have a shallow perched aquifer, likely related to irrigation return flows that resulted from flood irrigation over the past numerous over the past decades, which a lot of that, now some of this perched aquifer water is going to be drying up as we've switched to center pivot irrigation and, or side roll. We have an alluvial aquifer and we have the underlying basalt aquifer, the Columbia River Basalt Series, that's got interbedded sands within the basalts. These three aquifers are hydrologically connected either through natural pathways or through wells completed into more than one of these single aquifers. And only about a third of the wells sampled by EPA uh, had not had any information on the depth and screen depths, which is an unfortunate omission. This is a cross section. These are three. These are three actual wells. Here's the Yakima River, and we didn't put the specific ownership of the wells on any of these wells, but all this information comes from the ecology website or other well logs that we have access to. So you can see well one here is completed down in through there, there, okay, so we have a, an alluvial, the clay, gravel, and sand aquifer here. We have the basalt aquifer, part of the Columbia River basalts, and we have the sandstone or sand and clay that's interbedded in, within the basalt aquifer itself. So if you look this deepest well here, which is about 800 feet deep, okay, is open hole below 359 feet. No screen, no casing. This well number two has its screen, this crosshatched area here shows the screened interval, is completed into the basalts and the sand aquifer, sandstone aquifer interbedded with the basalts. And well three here is screened into the sand aquifer itself. So as you can see, the, this triangle here represents the potentiometric surface or the water table surface in these wells and traced over to the Yakima River. But you can see that we have three wells that are completed three different ways, but yet they're all interconnected into the sand, uh, the alluvial aquifer, and the basalt aquifer, and the sandstone aquifer, sand aquifer, in, that's interbedded with the basalts. So pumping in this well can easily draw water from the alluvial aquifer, the, uh, the sand aquifer interbedded in the basalts, and the basalt aquifer itself. And as you can see, by the elevation of the water table, they've all got pretty much the same potentiometric surface or the same head. So if you're going to sample one of these wells, you're actually sampling composite from all of these aquifers, and you can't separate out the sources. So we really need a better study design. We need monitoring wells or existing wells with good completion information to characterize the aquifers and the groundwater flow direction in particular. So groundwater flow direction is from northwest to southeast. We need up gradient wells and down gradient wells 
uh, located down gradient from potential sources. None of the wells that EPA had were located down gradient of any of these potential septic tank clusters or improperly completed domestic wells or wells completed into these multiple, aqu multiple aquifer systems. Excuse me. So what's a proper monitoring will look like? Well, you want a surface completion where your casing extends above ground surface, protected by a concrete pad sloping away from the well, and these yellow steel pipes are in our lingo bowlers. So you're not running a tractor over them, you're not running a loader over them, or you're not backing a truck up into the well and destroying it. You want the monitoring well to be locked, and you want the screen straddling the top of the water table. So what did EPA do? Okay. Here's one of the wells EPA completed in the study. Here, improperly, it's located in a barge where water is going to collect. Okay. Water will accumulate around the well head. There's no surface pad around here. Literally, you want three foot by three foot, so any surface runoff will slope away from the well head. And it's astonishing to us that they actually completed this kind of wellhead, which is appropriate if you're doing an investigation at a gas station or a dry cleaner where you want a surface completion. And this is really more for an urban gasoline or chlorinated hydrocarbon type of monitoring on asphalt or concrete, not agricultural, and completed into a low spot. So in terms of how they selected well locations, this is what you don't want to see specifically because this is what will happen to a well that has this kind of completion. Okay, we did not go into this EPA well, even though it was unlocked and we could have had access to it, but this is the same kind of completion in another location showing how you can get surface runoff, and specifically here, this is water in a land application field, okay, where a consultant completed a monitoring well in the middle of the land application field. You can see that this water is inside the well vault here of this improperly completed well, and it's going to be seeping down into the well, causing contamination that it w may not be there in the subsurface. And if you have an improperly completed wellhead, then you can have a nice little environment for the gophers or the prairie dogs to start burrowing in and creating conduits from the surface into the annular space of the well or down into the well itself where you're going to have contamination from the surface that has nothing to do with the ground with the groundwater quality but we are inducing contamination from the surface into the groundwater from improperly completed and located monitoring wells and this is something you never want to see so in terms of the sampling design, it's, in, it's crucial for any study examining nitrate to sources to know about your well completion, the depth, degree of interconnectedness, and extent of the aquifers. None of this was provided in any of these three reports that EPA uh, completed. You need to know your groundwater flow direction and your aquifer parameters, hydraulic conductivity, uh, storage coefficient or specific yield in an unconfined aquifer, and transmissivity. If you don't have this information, the potential source identification and pathways cannot be accurately determined, and you're sort of throwing spaghetti against the wall and see what sticks. So an the analytical methods that were employed were looking at cl chloride and nitrate uh, concentrations, and once again, we have to look at these sources, and we can't lump them all together. Synthetic fertilizer has little to no chloride. Dairy lagoons will tend to have a higher chloride concentration, Septic systems will have intermediate concentrations. Once again, we have complicating factors. Our sources overlap. We have different geochemistry of source water. There were three different source waters that EPA did not differentiate in this study. We have shallow groundwater, we had deeper groundwater, and we had surface water sources associated with the Sunnyside Irrigation District canal system that diverts from the Yakima. So you've got to look at the geochemistry of each one of these individual source waters, and this wasn't done. 
This is from a study the Environment Department in New Mexico did in 2004, looking this is log of chloride in, in milligrams per liter and log constant and uh, numerical scale, arithmetic scale for nitrate. So you can see that based on this study, the range of concentration at dairies of your nitrate chloride concentration is huge. Septic systems is more tightly clustered and evaporative. Here's a meteoric. Uh, water, meteoric concentration for the nitrate to chloride ratios, and you can see what the evaporation portion is. And you can see here that we've got an overlap between dairies and septic systems that was specifically identified by the regulatory agency in New Mexico. So, once again, looking more at the geochemistry, looking at the nitrogen and oxygen isotopes, and I'm going to talk only about one slide on this, but my company did a cooperative study with Los Alamos National Laboratories a few years ago where we had $200,000 worth of uh, LANL laboratory and staff time and 16 dairies in two different states co-opted $100,000 of our fees to try and look for that silver bullet to look to see if isotopes actually could be that distinguishing characteristic uh, that you could point a finger to different sources of nitrate and groundwater, and it didn't work. Okay. See, the, the synthetic fertilizer has lower N15 values than organic sources, and higher O18 values. Problem is, nitrogen undergoes numerous biological transformations during mineralization. Once again, the sources overlap. And our green water, or what the regulators call wastewater, has a wide range of N15. So the nitrogen isotopic analysis requires a dairy-specific approach. And you'll get higher enrichments in dairy lagoons that are sitting there evaporating, and you'll have a higher concentration in those lagoons rather than in a lagoon where it's being turned over. So even within the same dairy, you can have different uh, ratios between um, N15 and O18 based on the age of the water, the green water in the lagoon. So from the USGS, we can look at, this is O18, N15 here, and there's a, a range of the different kinds of concentrations one would see in these isotopic ratios. So looking at the isotopes in water, the water in the lagoons evaporates, enriches the lagoon and groundwater beneath it if the lagoon has any significant leakage and boron is present in detergents and fertilizers and you have a unique range of boron 11 and we actually had a boron problem on one of our dairies in Nevada related to commercial compost. We had about 15,000 tons of compost on the ground at any given time and it was killing these high-end plants in Las Vegas during the boom times and the boron was actually present. I, we sort of went dumb when we realized we're one valley over from the borax mines in U.S. borax in Death Valley. But there's actually high concentration of boron in feed coming from, naturally coming from the feed in Nevada and Utah. So you've got to go out, there's a lot of people here who knows way more about nutrition than I'll ever know, but you've got to go back, have to go back to your feed sources to actually look at the boron sources too. And that's all I'm going to say about dairy nutrition. <laughs> so in terms of looking at our isotopes in water, these are different dairies. Here's the meteoric water line looking at uh, deuterium versus oxygen 18. And this one right here is down gradient from a dairy lagoon, which falls well below the meteoric water line. This one up here is upgraded from the lagoon, which falls a lot closer to the meteoric water line. And looking at, this is just a little snapshot of a um, study we did with Los Alamos, uh, but this one right here is from a dairy in New Mexico, downgraded from a corral near a pecan orchard, where if you look here, Here's a monitoring well that received flood irrigation. The green triangles are a monitoring well in the land application area. Here's a manure sample, and here's a fertilizer sample. So looking at the O18 N15 ratios, you can see 
based on the different sources, we've got very different ratios between uh, O18 and N15, and you have to be very site-specific. You can't try and do this on a regional basis. So I want to tie this into the nutrient management portion of this because Nicole helped me write my abstract, and she wanted me to have a nutrient management <laughs> portion in this talk and how it's really applicable to this. So really, you want to make sure your nutrients are applied at agronomic rates. By maintaining your agronomic rates, it won't leach beneath the root zone. You want to be sampling your irrigation and other production wells as part of your nitrogen loading calculations. You want to maintain good water quality and soil health. And you want to make informed decisions. And so what we did at the request of Dairyman, and this will be real quick, we developed a software program we call CAFO Web to manage your nutrients in real time. So you sample your sources, go through your lab, lab report, monitoring here, the consultants or the dairymen can use this, you enter it into the software, and you look at your trends, both in your discharge, your monitoring wells, lagoon soils, anything like that, and you can predict your application rates in real time from both freshwater, green water, and fertilizer. Here's an example on a uh, real life dairy where the nitrogen uptake is the green bar, the yellow bar is the nitrogen applied on each one of these crops. And so after this dairy went through many, many years of having high nitrates in soils, we were able to work with them to bring this concentration down. So our conclusions based on our review of the EPA reports are, you know, the report provide a significant lack of supporting technical documentation, documentation to reach their conclusions. Groundwater flow direction is really important, may be modified by geologic structures and irrigation practices. Very limited data on well completion, screened intervals, pump setting, anything about the wells that we look at as resource production geologists and hydrologists. Really critical, critical information that there are only about 30% of the wells had any information provided. You know, this results in severely limiting EPA's ability to verify if the wells were upgrading or downgrading potential sources because they're producing from multiple water-bearing zones. There was no water table map constructed from any of the water levels. There's actually no water level information provided in the reports. You know, the dairies and the other sites are located in a very complex matrix of farming and septics, which makes the source tracking next to impossible without a detailed knowledge of the aquifer and well properties. And so based on our conclusions from this report done a couple of years ago at the time, EPA did not produce any enforcement quality um, data from the study. So looking at this and looking at the sources, the most important thing is any of these studies, you really want to know where your recharge originates. Okay? And, and this is actual sampling we conducted earlier this month you know, looking at the actual isotopic composition of the snow that will turn into recharge for springs in certain areas. And that's it. Thank you. No will answer any questions. Okay, questions for Jay? Where do we locate information on that CAFO web that you... Um, just go Google, Google CAFOweb.com. Okay, yeah. thank you. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Yeah, with, with the recent decision that's come down from, from the dairies around this area, did, did they do this type of analysis to really determine where the nitrate levels and things were coming that, that the homes and things were detecting? I'm not here to talk about any specific dairy or any specific lawsuit. The yes, samplers uh, actually like you know, purge a couple of different volumes of the, you know, of, of the well itself so they could get a you know, kind of eliminate that surface water that may have affected some of the numbers? We, when we did our review, and I know even before we did the review, no, when we, did, we requested EPA's field notes to look at their purging records to make sure that they purged at least three to five well bore volumes or in absence of that, to make sure they purged the wells enough uh, so that pH and conductivity stabilized and nobody made that information available. That information was not made available to us by EPA, although if EPA requested it from us, we would have to supply that information. Yeah, no, this, yeah, it, it was, 
they gave us what they wanted to give us, and so it made our review that much more difficult, and EPA could have possibly exonerated themselves from some of these conclusions that we reached if they had given us their field notes and, you know, shown what they actually did in the field, but it wasn't made available to us, sir. Okay, a couple more questions, and then we need to 